Hello and welcome to today's event, Holding the Taliban Accountable, Utilizing International Leverage to Stop Rights Abuses. I'm Milan Brevere and I direct the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. We come together today on the margins of the 50th session of the UN Human Rights Council to focus on the growing number of human rights abuses against the Afghan people, particularly the women and girls of Afghanistan by the Taliban. The Taliban are escalating attacks on women. Many of their lives are increasingly in jeopardy. The Taliban have imposed sweeping restrictions on women from their right to work and engage in public life of their society to forbidding girls above the sixth grade the right to go to school. They have decreed that women must be covered in the burqa and women broadcasters must now cover their faces. They have even forbidden women from getting a driver's license and, and increasingly from using public transportation without being accompanied by a male. Courageous women who demonstrate against these draconian measures are dealt with harshly. The Taliban have dissolved the Human Rights Commission and shut down ministries. The former Ministry of Women, for example, is now the Ministry for Vice and Virtue. At the same time, Afghanistan is confronting a humanitarian crisis. Access to food and healthcare has reached crisis proportions and there are reports of Taliban interference on the delivery of the assistance that is getting in. Moreover, the Taliban have done nothing to ease the situation, either the banking system, which is on the brink of collapse, or addressing the severe economic dislocation. Their citizens have not been protected against attacks by ISIS-K, which has killed several hundred. Moreover, reports indicate that the ties between the Taliban and Al Qaeda remain close. In short, they have broken every promise made to the international community to respect and protect human rights and women's rights. Our, qu our question today for our esteemed panelists is what leverage does the international community have against the Taliban's actions. We know the Taliban seek recognition as the legitimate government of Afghanistan. They seek recognition in foreign capitals and the desire to sit in the Afghanistan seat at the United Nations. What is the role of further sanctions? There is an upcoming vote in the UN. Should the waiver that some Taliban leaders have to travel be revoked? What about the conditionality? What role does it play, if any? Which governments can influence the Taliban? Would greater diplomacy with predominantly Muslim governments make a difference? How does the international community engage with the Taliban? We have many questions that we hope to have discussed in today's presentations. Uh, and we look forward now to hear from our uh, experts who are with us. They are Afghan women leaders, as well as foreign policy experts on Afghanistan. And we are eager to gain their insights and hear their recommendations. Let me turn first to Ambassador Tony Wayne a career ambassador and leading expert on Afghanistan. He served as former United States Deputy, Deputy Ambassador to Afghanistan. He also served as, in Kabul as Coordinator Director for Development and Economic Affairs. He has had a distinguished career in the United States diplomatic service, including as Assistant Secretary of State for the economy and business affairs, and as the US former ambassador to Mexico and to Argentina. 
And currently he is the Distinguished Diplomat in Residence at American University School of International Service. He has written widely about the current state of affairs in Afghanistan. Welcome, Ambassador Wayne. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you very much, Ambassador Verveer, and thanks for the wonderful introduction and description of the interests at play here. Since we have a number of very well-informed experts on some of the specifics involving women and girls, I thought I'd start off setting a little bit the broader context for how the U.S. government is looking at Afghanistan. Um, as you all know, they, they have a number of, of key interests in play, including human rights and women's rights and girls' rights, but there's much less leverage available than uh, we've had in the past. And we have a regime in Kabul that is really much less concerned about what the world thinks and really focused on maintaining the internal unity of the Taliban government. And this is a situation in which the most conservative members of the Taliban seem to be able to determine outcomes because there is such a desire to maintain that unity. So this makes it very hard to think this through. As I start off, I want to mention there's an excellent study done recently by the RAND Corporation um, with uh, Ambassador Jim Dobbins and others contributing to it. That, that examines different approaches the US should consider. And I, I recommend uh, taking a look at that if people want to understand some of the big strategic axes that are involved here. Basically, they point out, they explore three ways to deal with the Taliban regime. One is some broad form of engagement. Second is isolating the Taliban regime. And third is actively opposing the Taliban regime. Uh, they conclude that some form of engagement is the way to move ahead, but they readily add when they say that this is gonna be very hard to do for all the reasons we're going to talk about today. It's not going to be easy to engage with this regime going to be easy to get constructive responses to them. And the United States will have to make a number of difficult decisions, either to move forward in some way or to pull back in some way during this process. But, but it's worth looking at that. So briefly, what are the various areas of US interest that, that policymakers are thinking through as they, they work on dealing with this regime and the situation in the country? The first, first one to mention, of course, is what we're focused on today. Human rights in Afghanistan, democracy, the rights of women and girls, the rights of ethnic minorities, retaining some degree of the democratic practices um, that, we, that really did develop over the last 20 years. Secondly is the area of counterterrorism and the desire, the widespread desire, nobody wants new terrorist attacks emanating from Afghanistan. Uh, for whatever reason in one way or another. The third is what we've been trying to do over recent months, which is to meet the humanitarian and basic relief needs of the people of Afghanistan. And beyond that, to help stop people from falling into or remaining in poverty and to have access to basic medical services and ideally basic education services as we go forward. We'll get to talk about that today for sure. Um, then there, there is the important role of facilitating the departure of Afghans who were particularly close to the United States and who really desire to leave the country and have, have other strong ties to the United States. And finally, we have an interest just in understanding what's going on in Afghanistan, knowing what the dynamics are and where leverage might be found as we go forward. So, Given those interests, what are, the, what are the challenges? Well, the big challenge is that we don't have any policy punches that carry a lot of weight. Um, it, it's going to be tough to decide what policy steps can get a response and, um, and then how to respond, depending on the response you get, where to go ne next. As um, I mentioned, 
To begin with, the Taliban are very much focused on their own internal unity. There's no effective opposition to them now or on the horizon, even if there might maybe in several years, the broad spread view right now is that that's not going to happen for a while. Um, the Taliban are working from the lessons that they learned during their long struggle. So it's important to remember that. That did include minimizing internal divisions, um, pressing toward the goals, the basic goals of this Islamic, uh, toward an Islamic emirate. And third, operating very secretively because that's the way they had to operate during this period of time. Um, I think it's important to note that if there happened to be for one reason or another, a collapse of the Taliban regime, the outcome would probably be chaos and a lot more human suffering in the short run. Um, so we've already seen the Afghan people suffer tremendously and, and many are still suffering. So we certainly don't want to magnify that. And we want to keep this basic, a, a basic channel open to provide at least humanitarian and relief assistance. So how can we signal the cost of Taliban behavior um, in, in an in an effective way and still meet these broad interests. That's what uh, my colleagues will help, help us explore today going forward. Um, clearly, we need to keep engaging with international partners, with partners in the region, at the United Nations and other international organizations, even if we haven't seen great responsiveness from the Taliban regime, they do listen to what's said about them. So there's some degree, there's some people in this regime that pay attention. The challenge is that those who pay attention may not be able to sway the, the decision making at this time, but we need to keep that up. Um, we need to also have enough engagement with international organizations, with other donors, um, that we can keep the assistance flowing and help restrain some of those who are very very eager to engage and maybe recognize the Taliban regime. And I think so far, though people have been, different countries have engaged more than the United States has, there is not a great movement toward recognition, in part because the Taliban regime has been behaving despic despicably in, in, many, in many instances, which we'll get to talk about today. Um, the one area that I, I know will be talked about, and I'm pretty sure Annie Forsheimer will mention this, and you already mentioned it, and Ron Newman and Ann Patterson, two distinguished foreign American ambassadors, raised this just in the past few days, is indeed the uh, UN ban on travel that is coming up for, will be uh, renewed if there is not a step to keep this uh, exception to allow Taliban leaders to travel going. And um, a number of people believe that this would be a way to send a strong signal to the Taliban that they would care about to some degree, um, that, they, that what they've been doing uh, in their policies toward women and girls is not acceptable. So I'm sure my colleagues will explore that further as we, as we go forward. And then, but the big challenge for the United States sort of going forward is, okay, if we, if we all agree in principle that some form of engagement is going to happen. What should that look like? What's a step-by-step -step process? Should it include a visit to Kabul? Should it include also a requirement that you talk to the people in Kandahar who appear to be blocking uh, in progressive policies? Um, if there happened to be a CT, uh, uh, pardon me, if there happened to be a, a terrorist attack coming from Afghanistan, there's widespread agreement that the United States would and should respond to that. But short of that, should we assure and, and try to move toward a better dialogue with the Taliban, maybe through intelligence channels on counterterrorism than we have right now? Um, as, you know, should we consider a small presence of officials in Kabul. There are a number of other embassies that continue to exist there. We have intersections in various parts of the world where we can carry out consular 
uh, affairs, and we know there are, are a number of people with ties to the United States that we could help, perhaps, if we had a presence there? Do we want a better opportunity to monitor the humanitarian and assistance relief that's going forward? Um, might we get a better understanding by having some diplomats there? Now, this is not talking about recognizing the Taliban regime. It's talking about having a practical on the ground working presence. So I think that that needs to be thought through and carefully considered because there are a number of advantages um, to having some people at a technical levels on the ground there to do some of these, uh, some of these activities. But whatever this is going, to, uh, we're going to do going forward, it's clearly going to have step by step and step uh, process and the Taliban are going to need uh, to respond and we should respond based on how they are engaging. And clearly uh, we're going to hear about a number of tremendously negative steps uh, that are things that are happening now in Afghanistan and there would need to be um, positive responses on a number of these concerns. So let me leave it here and we'll get to hear uh, from my very well informed uh, colleagues on the very important issues involving women and girls and human rights more broadly. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador, for, for giving us that context, um, for raising obviously a lot of the tough questions, um, for even mentioning the, the waiver from the tra travel ban, whether that should be revoked. I'm sure there are opinions among your fellow panelists uh, as to specific directions. Uh, so we will proceed uh, with that, and then hopefully you can come back and uh, respond to what they have to say before we open it up to the audience. I want to turn now to Afghanistan's former ambassador uh, to the United Nations, uh, Ada Laraz. She was the first woman to hold the permanent representative position at the UN for her country. Uh, she began her career with the UN assistance mission uh, in Afghanistan, UNAMA, and went on to serve in numerous government positions, including as the first female deputy spokesperson and director of communications uh, for then President Karzai. Today, she serves as the director of the Afghanistan Policy Lab uh, at Princeton's School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, good morning. Ambassador Raz, it's always good to see you. Um, I wondered if we could draw from your experience at the UN, um, what do you see as some of the most effective opportunities uh, to have leverage with the Taliban, if any? Uh, where do you see the Security Council these days with all of the limitations uh, that that body has? Um, and perhaps as a diplomat also, you can uh, um, touch on uh, relations uh, with the regional powers and how they might be used more effectively. So please. Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Ambassador, for uh, inviting me and thank you for um, giving me the space to be part of this esteemed panelist today and discuss I think probably one of the most difficult questions that uh, we all are struggling and handling uh, in front of us, which is, I think, the way forward uh, in Afghanistan. We're definitely at the most difficult part of the history we have experienced in the last 20 years. And that's really unfortunate towards women of Afghanistan, the civil society, the younger generation. And that was always the strength of our country. And today it's, it's very heartbreaking to see that strength is almost broken into uh, several pieces. But um, I think it, it should not discourage us. It should give us even uh, greater urgency to move forward to find the ways on how to make sure we don't lose the people of Afghanistan. I always say it's a country with 38 million population and we cannot abandon them. We have to make sure that not only they have access to food, but they also have access to the life that they used to live. Um, coming to uh, the question you asked, uh, Ambassador uh, Vivir, in terms of uh, what are the leverages that the UN can um, tap on? What is the role of Security Council and then the region? Uh, starting with the UN and Security Council, um, I think 
it is a very important and critical uh, tool that the Security Council right now have. And you also mentioned it is the travel ban that right now does exist with the UN Council and with the United Nation and the engagement that the UN has in Afghanistan, probably the largest and the biggest UN mission uh, as of now is in Afghanistan. And that means the type of resources that's facilitated by the UN to be uh, available to the existing regime. That gives them the strength and the ability to the United Nation to uh, maneuver and to implement policies or ask for policies and pressure Taliban. But um, I say uh, when it comes to um, funding and humanitarian aid, I always say conditioning aid will uh, not truly change the behavior of Taliban because uh, we're dealing with a regime that their legitimacy have not arrived by the public, by the people of Afghanistan because uh, or they have, ha haven't come to power because they were uh, elected. Their legitimacy came by force. And also a reflection of what happened 25 years ago when they were in power at the time. Uh, I remember very clearly the country was in complete isolation and complete darkness and uh, the, 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 the major human humanitarian crises we were facing and hunger and famine, but the regime didn't feel the, uh, the pressure to uh, hand over Osama bin Laden at the time or, or even change their policies when it was towards a woman of Afghanistan uh, than either. So I think we have to clearly remember that uh, today it's a larger country with a larger population and we must make sure that their needs and the basic needs and that's food and that's access to health and then, of course, access to education, it must be protected and pressured. So uh, humanitarian aid could not be conditioned. And coming in terms of uh, what are the other tools, I think two uh, very important tools right now we have in front of us, despite that uh, we do say international recognition may not matter to them, I would say it really mattered to them because um, uh, we have seen over and over that there has been great emphasis uh, by the Taliban regime to uh, pressure the international community, uh, in fact, to ask for recognition. So I believe this is one of the most effective and the most important tool we have, and we have to use it in a very efficient way, and we shouldn't grant it right away. And we also have to even reflect uh, in terms of uh, for some of the countries that they don't quote unquote formally say they have not recognized Taliban, but they have every uh, type of engagement. Uh, and that comes on the foreign policy level as well, formal visits, non-formal visits. And I think in the foreign policy arena, we do know <clears throat> when visits from the foreign ministers happen, uh, it's a pretty high level of visits and it needs to be reconsidered uh, to a uh, Taliban regime that has banned women from education. And I think that's very simple. Even it doesn't need uh, greater thinking, one needs to uh, reflect. Um, the travel ban, I think I always say pressuring the people and the public would be uh, the most um, a heartbreaking or how do I say the most ineffective tool because uh, we have seen that before we have seen it with other countries as well when a dictator regime is in power um, it doesn't matter to them how much uh, the public is in stress it the pressure needs to arrive individually and I think in this uh, way we have to be even more creative uh, how can uh, we be uh, moving forward and finding ways? Uh, we have to question, uh, do, they, do we have Taliban's family? Do they live overseas? Uh, do their families have access to education? Uh, their girls do go to school. Um, do they have uh, bank accounts outside? These are all uh, very important, very critical questions that we need to raise because the pressure needs to arrive individually versus the pressure on the public because that will not uh, create any type of result and that's where the travel ban is playing an important role and we need to ask how it could be utilized. In terms of the region, I think um, I will split this question in two parts, a region um, in Central Asia or the immediate neighboring countries, if I may say, and outside of the neighboring countries and for that I really wanted to emphasize in the Gulf, Gulf countries. If we look um, in, the, in the first uh, um, uh, number of countries in the, in, in the first circle, in a way, the immediate neighbors, uh, we do live in a very um, 
changing region. Uh, and, and I think the type of security threat uh, that will emerge from Afghanistan and the reports that are coming, it's going to be threats to the immediate neighbors uh, sooner. And, and, and that uh, does give the, the broader uh, region and the larger number of countries, especially the US and Europe, to work very closely with the region to make sure that uh, there is a unified message because they will be the first countries that will be impacted by the change that has happened in Afghanistan. Now, coming to um, the, the broader region, the Gulf countries, I think we live in a, a very interesting moment compared to 25 years ago where first Taliban came uh, to power then. Um, the, the Gulf countries are changing through um, more liberal steps. Uh, so uh, we have seen greater openness happening in even the most uh, controversial and the most difficult Gulf countries that we have always had uh, known and, and, and had known about their policies towards women. And in Taliban regime in Afghanistan is in contradiction to what the change they are going through. They have started to open a new chapter of uh, um, uh, liberal Islam and uh, the rights of women. Women are coming up uh, unveiled. Uh, they go to school, they start to drive, they are in the leadership positions. And it's it's really important steps. It's, it's still probably not where we see to uh, see all the women, but it's it really is critical steps. So I think it's also a question to see what it really means for them to see a radical and Islamist uh, and absolutely backward uh, and conservative regime in Afghanistan and, and how much it's going to impact their policies because um, they're taking a new type of steps and being the new role models. And I think that is something we need to really tap on. 25 years ago, it wasn't the case. And I think we have remembered that. But now it is the case, and, and that could be also not even singling out one country to be engaged. I think we can create a unified force behind uh, some of the Gulf countries. We do understand their own um, differences uh, that they have, uh, but uh, we work in the foreign policy arena and we have always a were able to a certain level to uh, create the type of platform that brings all, all of them in the same page because, and for some of them, the, the interest is the same. So I think that needs to be tapped on uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to stop here and I will give the floor to uh, remaining uh, panelists, but I uh, will be more than happy to answer questions and uh, I will have my own questions so too. Thank you, Ambassador. No, well, thank you, um, Ambassador Raz. You covered a, no a number of levers um, uh, in your discussion just now. You reminded us of the importance of recognition and what a strong lever that is. Um, foreign minister visits uh, measures against individual Taliban. Uh, that is not often raised. Uh, it certainly uh, would factor into the revoking of the of the waiver, the travel waiver, but it's something beyond where most discussion I think occurs today. Um, and also the implications for the neighbors in the Gulf states. So you've opened up a number of areas for our uh, panelists to uh, continue to, to, to discuss. And with that, we'll turn now to uh, Annie Forsheimer, who is a former United States diplomat who served as acting deputy assistant secretary of state for Afghanistan and earlier as the deputy chief of the mission in Kabul. Uh, her 30 year career spans issues relating to security, rule of law, human rights, and so much more. Uh, she's worked on the National Security Council and been posted as a diplomat in many, many countries around the world. Annie, it's so great to have you with us. I know you're currently a non-resident associate uh, at CSIS and an adjunct professor um, at City University in New York. And you have really given a lot of thought uh, to these issues and written widely uh, about them. Uh, so given your past work um, at the UN on sanctions in particular and in Afghanistan uh, as deputy chief of the United States mission, what leverages do you see um, as uh, 
potentially effective because we know that not all of them have been uh, perhaps adequately utilized. Um, and, and really in the, in the broader construct, what do you see uh, in terms of what should be happening that isn't happening? Sure, thank you so much for including me in this uh, amazing discussion. Um, and I think I'll answer your question in a way by focusing very uh, tightly on that issue of the travel ban. So to me, reinstating the full uh, UN sanctions travel ban is a unique and time-bound opportunity to demonstrate some consequences of the Taliban abuses. And I think we should flip the script a little bit. The case for allowing the travel ban exemption to expire isn't the one that needs justified. It's the case for continuing that waiver. So what exactly are the sanctions? The UN sanctions are linked to Taliban cooperation with international terrorist groups. And no one disputes that the sanctions themselves should remain in place. That rationale, it was most recently confirmed by a report of the UN Sanctions Committee in May of this year, and which assessed that the Al Qaeda has a safe haven under the Taliban and increased freedom of action as do other regional terror groups. So there are three sections to the sanctions which have been in place for decades. Financial asset freezes, a weapons ban, and a travel ban. And the sanctions apply to 135 people, individuals, and five entities. In 2018, the US requested an exemption for travel for 14, and now it's 15 people which was justified by their engagement in reconciliation and peace talks. Now, incredibly, this exemption has been renewed three times since the Taliban violently overthrew the government in September 2021, December 2021, and March 2022. And it was justified for travel in peace and stability discussions. The exemption expires next week if there is no consensus for it to continue. Its justification is completely and utterly bogus, and it should expire. So why is this even a question? One European diplomat recently told me that members of the former NATO coalition are immobilized by self-doubt regarding efforts to stand for international principles. But doing so is appropriate and it's important. The Taliban do not represent a majority of Afghans and probably never will. They have taken power by force and they hold it by terror. And they shouldn't be photographed on jets going to world capitals as if they were legitimate rulers. Now to those who fear that we would lose cooperation on safe passage, my answer is that that is an operational consideration that shouldn't lead us to make a strategic mistake. I mean, the alternative policy option is continuing this exemption. And that would be read as a strong statement to the Taliban that their rule is acceptable and that they are a de facto government whose ministers can travel freely. It would empower even more vicious abuses and even less forthcoming behavior, which wouldn't help us on an operational level either. And what have we learned after more than two years of bargaining with the Taliban out of fear of what they will do or in order to promote the so-called moderates or just to keep talking? We've learned that their side sticks to their ideological red lines and uses words and theater to keep us occupied. And with regard to the straw man argument about protecting their moderates, which some have made, we have been played repeatedly by this sort of good cop, bad cop charade. The moderates have no power to deliver, despite our repeated concessions. But if we instead stick to our own red lines, we will have the Taliban's attention. And even if, and, and if we don't stick to our red lines, as I mentioned, we will have sent an equally powerful signal 
that our words are not backed by actions. Everything that we want and need from the Taliban with respect to international human rights norms and standards and political inclusion is going to be hard for them to deliver as, you know, as Ambassador Wayne has referred to and many people have noted. So their motivation has got to be even stronger. To those who worry that the travel ban will cut off dialogue, that really is an operational matter. If they want to talk substantively, the sanctions allow ways to request exemptions for specific meetings. Plus, there are lower ranking Taliban who are still permitted to travel. Plus, there's Zoom. <laughs> After several years of supposed peace talks in person, in which they gave no respect to fellow Afghans, the bar should be extremely high to justify the physical presence of known high-level terrorists at meetings with US officials. Finally, at, at a more general level of foreign policy considerations, sanctions are a tool. And they're a tool that we reach for in order to address difficult worldwide problems like those in Iran or Russia. We don't want to excessively weaken this tool. The travel ban should be, should be reapplied because the rules require it. It's ironic, there's an argument that isolationist policies fail. So we should compromise in this case. But that argument isn't really used to compromise on Russian, North Korean, or other sanctions. And to those who argue finally, that the travel ban won't be observed and that that would weaken the sanctions regime, that is a poor reason to avoid doing what's necessary. As we're seeing right now with respect to Ukraine, it is hard, but it is important to protect sanctions regimes through the full range of diplomatic or economic powers of persuasion. So to wrap up, allowing the travel ban exemption to expire next week would be a targeted gesture applying to just 15 people that wouldn't hurt ordinary Afghans. The way that cutting assistance or tightening economic sanctions would, as Ambassador Ross has mentioned. And it sends a message to those Afghans who need a lot more than the thoughts and prayers response of the international community to their ongoing disaster. Thank you. Well, Annie, you've uh, put a lot on the table and uh, made a very strong case for why it's important uh, to uh, um, affirmatively revoke uh, the travel ban exemption uh, that currently exists. And I'm sure others will want to respond to that as well. Uh, and thank you, too, for really setting up uh, a greater understanding of sanctions, how they work, how, how they're supposed to work, uh, and then where we stand with respect to uh, the issues that are always raised about uh, hindering cooperation and engagement, because all of that is of a whole here. Uh, so we'll turn now to Haraya Mozajik, Ahoria, excuse me, uh, a widely respected Afghan human rights defender. Horia is leading the Risk Mitigation Organization. It's a local NGO that works to keep women safe and secure, uh, especially in these difficult times, and I must say, uh, increasingly difficult to do. Uh, Horia has extensive experience working with human rights defenders uh, who are at great risk, has worked with the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission and with Amnesty International. Among, among other groups. <coughs> and excuse me, we're especially happy uh, to have her with us today to give us a sense of what is happening on the ground um, and what she thinks international actions uh, would do to change the Taliban's uh, own uh, horrible record that we are witnessing. Uh, if at all, what leverage can be utilized without harming the Afghan people? Uh, so, um, Horia, give us a sense of all of this that we've been discussing uh, with a strong uh, understanding of what is happening on the ground in Afghanistan. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam uh, Ambassador. I think uh, it's a pleasure to be among you all and especially uh, listening to other fellow speakers. Uh, I just want to say I can't be more agree with the points that uh, Ambassador Annie already mentioned and raised. And I think it is really, really key and crucial to remind ourselves once more that who we are trying to show flexibility to a group that have been part of the United Nations terrorist sanction list, to a group that have housed and harbored terrorist groups that caused the 9-11, a group that is sharing bit with all other terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda, including Daesh, among others. Uh, as an Afghan, it is heartbreaking to see that how international justice and international law has become a, 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 a mockery because one day someone is on the international sanction list and the next day they are out and they are delisted. So many times we as Afghans, we are asking this question, how bad you could be to make yourself into the UN sanction list and how worse you have to be to get delisted. Unfortunately, this is, uh, I, I think, I don't know what message the United Nations, the Security Council, and many other powerful countries want to send to the world. If you are policing human rights, if you are policing international justice, if you are policing uh, you know, democratic values, then you have to stay truthful to the constituents as well. You have to stay truthful to your own people, at least if it is not for hours. Because at the end of the day, you know, whatever you do, it also has not only an implication on us, but also on your own people. Respect the victims of the terrorist activities and, and, and your own people that have lost their lives in, in the past 20 years, uh, you know, in Afghanistan and in other parts of the world. So uh, I think in this situation, my question will be that when we speak about like allowing Taliban to travel, giving them international podium, extending red carpet, allowing them to travel by private jets and, and travel to the European capitals. And my question is again, like, you know, where is the international justice? Someone who had a bounty on his head of $20 million by the CIA and FBI, everyone knows he's sitting at the Ministry of Interior of Afghanistan. So what does it really mean? Are we making a fun and joke of ourselves or the other people? Simply, the, you know, Afghans are not stupid. You know, let, let's, let's put it that way. Like we understand what is happening behind the scene. We understand what games are being played at the bigger and international level. But what is really even more heartbreaking to see is that the level of tolerance that has been shown towards the Taliban, the level of flexibility that have been shown towards the Taliban, it simply gave, gave us the opposite result. They didn't show that level of flexibility. The international community keeps begging them, please allow girls to go to school. This is not too much to ask. Afghanistan still remains the only single country in the world that women and girls are not allowed to go to school. Afghanistan still stays one of those countries that women and girls are not allowed to leave their homes without a main chaperone. And I'm just going to tell you that the number of human rights violations and abuses and war crimes that have been committed by the Taliban, particularly in the course of nine months, it has been the highest since 2001, at least as much as I can recall. This is not just about the you know, crackdown on peaceful protesters, mostly women, the disappearances of the protesters, killing, extrajudicial killings, torture, arbitrarily arrest of not only former members of the security forces, but even people who have worked for the international organizations, people who work as contractors, people who are part of the civil society, journalists, among others. Even today, I have a list of 
several journalists that have been taken by the Taliban, including one from copies of province, simply because he was exercising his right as a journalist to report on what's happening in the province. So many civilians are getting killed simply because they are belong to a particular province. The number of human rights violations and war crimes that are committed in Panjshir and in Andarab is have never seen before. And beside all that, when we speak about the counterterrorism, what really counterterrorism means when Al Zawahiri is announcing its allegiance and obedience to the Mullah Haibatullah? How far we want the Taliban to go before you realize that nothing has changed in the Taliban? And when we also speak about the internal division, there is already internal division. Yesterday, there was a fighting in, in, uh, in Takhar province between Taliban groups, which resulted in the killing of at least seven civilians among the Taliban fighters. And those fractions and divisions are getting deeper and deeper. Daesh is more than any other time active inside Afghanistan. And they have a free zone to operate attacks against ethnic minorities, religious minorities, including attack on Hazaras have been uh, escalating once more, unfortunately. So in this situation, I would like to just, you know, make a couple of recommendations. And I think these recommendations, let's, let's remind ourselves that as Ambassador Annie already mentioned, that travel ban could be the least imposed travel ban on all senior readership of the Taliban and Haqqani network. And that must include their travel by air, by land, and including to our neighboring countries. Impose penalties and sanctions on the countries who are violating the UN Security Council sanctions on travel ban of the group. Stop sending cash to the Taliban. Every week, millions of dollars of cash being transported to Afghanistan and being handed over to the Taliban through Afghanistan International Bank. And, you know, and, and this money is enabling Taliban to continue with their human rights violations. That money has nothing to do with the aid delivery, with the service delivery, or to do something good for the people of Afghanistan. That money is simply used by the Taliban to violate even further uh, the, the human rights of Afghans. They impose also asset freeze on all assets and businesses of the Taliban leadership and Haqqani network and ensure that that includes their assets in the Middle East, in our neighboring countries and anywhere around the world. Channel the aid through the humanitarian assistance to Afghans uh, through UN, through international and local aid agencies. Ensure that women are not only part of the aid delivery, but also they are the recipient of the aid. Because when women are not allowed to work, when women are not allowed to travel without a male chaperone, the number of aid assistance, uh, sorry, the need for the aid among women is at highest now. And the woman poverty is increasing significantly. Every day you will see more and more women are begging on these streets. More girls are put for sale by the families. And it, it clearly it indicates that putting and cash flow to the Taliban are not helping Afghans. It's just enabling the Taliban to become even more vicious. Thank you. No, thank you, Horia, uh, for your fundamental question, where is international justice? And for uh, giving us your recommendations, uh, not just on the travel ban, truly imposed on all the Taliban, uh, but also on raising it with the countries that are not following uh, the sanctions, uh, cutting off the financial resources that are continuing, uh, as well as an asset freeze and more. So now we've heard from all of you, and I wonder if each of you, any of you want to raise uh, questions or add anything to what each of you has said 
uh, before we turn to our audience. So are there any brief reactions uh, to what uh, one or the other of you have said? Otherwise, we'll turn to our audience. Anybody wanna add anything? Okay, well, why don't we turn to our audience questions uh, and uh, hear from, from them. Allie? Yeah, it looks like we have a hand up from Horia. Do you want to weigh in there, Horia? Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, it was you, Madam uh, Ambassador Melen, that you mentioned about which countries can influence the Taliban. Yes. I think this is an open secret. You know, we all know that Taliban are being supported by the Pakistan. So I think Pakistan will be one of the countries that can definitely influence the Taliban. And then it, it also, it should follow by Qataris, by Turkey, by Saudi Arabia, because these are also the countries who are very much willing to, you know, wrap shoulder with the Taliban and they are also supporting the group in one or the other way. So it is really important that you can hold talks with these countries and ensure that how they can influence the Taliban to the policy change and, and, and to, you know, at least their take on, on uh, women's rights, on, on girls' education, among other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, we'll go to the first audience question here. We have a few from representatives from international humanitarian organizations um, asking, what is the plan if the Taliban do respond to punishment and sanctions by restricting the international community's ability to deliver aid and access to populations in need? We're very concerned about our, our limited access being jeopardized or blocked. Um, and then it's questioned specifically to Horia asking, what are your colleagues on the ground saying with regards to all this? And are they worried about the backlash? Who would like to start? Well, Horia, maybe maybe you should, uh, because you have uh, talked about the need to, to cut off uh, a lot of these um, resources that continue to flow in Afghanistan, as well as um, the, the need to uh, bear in mind that the Taliban have not responded in any way that has made a difference. What about the threat of cutting off the humanitarian aid if more significant measures are imposed against the Taliban? Well, I mentioned in my recommendations that ensure all the humanitarian aid, it goes to the country by the UN, by the international and local humanitarian agencies. Because at the end of the day, these are the organizations that are ensuring that the aid should reach out to the people in need, not the Taliban because we have seen that the more cash flow to the Taliban, it means that they are being more and more empowered both militarily and intelligence wise. So this has done very little to change the life of the Afghan people or to improve their access to aid or to access to food and other essentials. Thank you. Annie, I think you had your hand up next and then Ambassador Wayne. Sure. And I want to say that that is a, you know, it's a serious concern. Nobody, nobody would imagine uh, that it's taken lightly. But, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, to do otherwise with respect to the travel ban is really to give just a complete green light to what we are seeing. And I think there are plenty of problems with aid delivery and inequalities, which are getting worse you know, right now when all of these concessions have been given. I think it's an appropriate and targeted measure in this, you know, and there are other measures to take, of course, but this one is appropriate and targeted. And if their response is to deny aid to those most in need of it, you know, there has to be a conversation, but it doesn't mean that you don't take the response which is appropriate under international law and which sends the signal that the international community should be send sending about this you know, the abrogation of human rights. Ambassador Wayne? Well, just to add that, that of course, all these issues are, are very important, but we're already having a lot of reports from Afghanistan that the Taliban are intervening with NGOs to try to 
uh, direct their humanitarian programs in a way they were not doing months ago. And this is part of them trying to assert, I'm sure, more control and more influence. So it's a very difficult set of circumstances because the goal is to keep Afghans alive um, and to keep them or bring them back out of poverty if they've fallen into poverty, which many of them have. And so it's, it's really hard for us, of course, from here to make a judgment. We do have to listen to the NGOs as to the problems they're facing. And, and then I think it's right as an international community, um, speak loudly and firmly with, uh, with the Taliban and, and uh, just try to find better ways for them to get that message to them and to, and to make it uh, have some, some weight. And we've had a few ideas thrown out there right now. Uh, this might be just one more reason actually to uh, weigh in heavily on this travel ban as a first step and to signal that there could be more steps in, in that sense that don't endanger the lives of, of Afghan citizens. Thank you. I, I think we have time for one more question, Allie. Sure, this one is on general metrics for sanctions removal, asking if the Taliban takes some positive steps such as opening up girls' education, how can we ensure that they will go further on other rights, such as freedom of speech, access to justice, women's political participation, et cetera? Where should we draw the line in terms of sanctions removal and how should the international community approach this? Well, Let that just, question actually, goes so to the heart of what we've been discussing. <laughs> Annie, uh, you wanna take that for starters? And I then apologize. maybe everybody yes. can weigh in as a conclusionary statement. I apologize. Yes, the, um, you know, in very narrow terms, sanctions removal should be linked to what put the sanctions there in the first place, which is their connection and cooperation with international terrorism. So I would say that human rights considerations are actually quite separate from sanctions imposition or removal. That has to be done on the terms uh, that I think human rights connect, uh, human rights concessions or advances or lack thereof is uh, very connected to the issue of recognition. And that's one area where I think it has to be tabulated. Ambassador Ross. I, I wanted to tap um, and, and add the same point that international recognition is uh, an important element that needs to be added uh, to all this conversation. In the broader human rights uh, element is a critical one, but it can be, um, only weight in uh, sanction or versus international recognition. I think a combination of few, because uh, if the regime expects itself to be recognized by the international community, to be treated like any other country, then the policies inside the country should be similar. And they have to, as a member of the international community, start to recognize and respect the conventions that the Afghan uh, Afghanistan had signed before, and and as a country we are responsible to report on it, and and that's the first step. That's the really really basic first step. Otherwise, um, um, not having international recognition also comes with certain constraints, which is not part of the sanctions. And I think that also needs to be uh, taken into consideration. And that's simply the engagement that we have with them. It's Ambassador time. Wayne. Yes, so, so just to add that, that of course, this is really gonna be really complicated. And eventually what you do need to have is a dialogue, uh, sort of parallel dialogue. It's a dialogue with the Taliban, private dialogue that would look at a sanction strategy, talk through what sanctions are very important, talk through recognition and see where you can get in that. But at the same time, you have to be talking with the regional partners and your international partners who care about democracy and human rights, which makes this very complicated, but it, it is going to have to be a progressive effort. And you do have to get the attention of the Taliban first and have them actually want so much that they want recognition that they're actually willing to do something for it. Yes, they'd like to be recognized. And yes, I'm sure they're somewhat upset that they have not been recognized yet, but they haven't been willing yet to take concrete steps to get that. That needs to be made clear from as wide a group of countries as possible sending similar messages. And then there do need to be 
really serious and probably tough private discussions that might start to map out what needs to happen over. And Horia, we're going to give you the last word. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think, you know, from uh, my understanding, I think diplomatic engagement so far, it, 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 it didn't bear us any fruit yet, you know, like showing any flexibility towards the Taliban didn't bear us any fruit. Like we have seen in over two years since the peace agreement between Taliban and the US has been signed, the situation has gone even worse. Like even many diplomats, they went around to sell uh, the idea to their capitals that Taliban have changed. But I think we, we agreed that Taliban have changed, but we said they have changed for worse. So now we are seeing that this is what's happening. And I think this is the time that the international community can show that this cannot be a one-way traffic, you know. You can show that, you know, there is a give and take, you know, like with every political or diplomatic engagement, which doesn't mean recognition, you should be able to put your red lines as uh, Ambassador Annie already mentioned, and compromising on your red lines, it makes the Taliban even more and more braver to push their boundaries and they can sell anything by the idea of this is uh, Afghan, this is Afghan uh, culture, or this is Sharia or whatever. They, they can put any name to their restrictions and without showing very little flexibility to, towards international pressure. Well, I think that uh, each of you has uh, done us a favor today in really expounding on uh, all of the issues that address this topic of holding the Taliban accountable. Um, you've really gone into depth about the difficulty of it, but also the consequences of not doing more than we are doing uh, to use uh, the levers that are available. And I think first and foremost, uh, the revoking of the, the travel ban exemption and the vote uh, that is coming up uh, in the Security Council may be that initial test of whether or not there will be just complete toleration by the international community of the ongoing uh, repressive actions uh, that the Taliban are taking every day uh, with little abandon, uh, in fact, getting worse by the day. Uh, so um, thank you so much for enlightening us for making us smarter about all of this, but hope, hopefully more than that, uh, actually moving uh, us to action in all the ways that we can apply uh, any influence. So thank you so much, Ambassador Wayne. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Raz, uh, Annie Povsheimer, uh, as well as Horia Mosadik. Thank you all. Thank you, Ambassador.